I became chairman of the hospice uh, back at the end of uh, last year. Uh, I grew up uh, around here. I, I went to Tunbridge School and I've lived here for most of my life. And the hospice has increasingly become uh, an absolutely vital part of the community. And for me, this was a chance to give something back to the community that I've been part of for such a long time. Well, it's been, it's been a, a really good year. We've uh, significantly exceeded our expectations. We set a goal of meeting more uh, unmet need and the referrals and the, the cases that we've looked up after have increased 28% uh, in the uh, last 15 months. And I think that's uh, a, a tremendous fulfilment of the goals that we set ourselves. I think one of the, uh, the really good things that happened in the, uh, the last uh, year has been the uh, creation of the labyrinth, uh, which is all about increasing the range of uh, holistic care and we were delighted to add a further uh, element to the, uh, the overall experience of the hospice. We only get about 15% of the overall funding that comes from the government. The rest is what we raise uh, through various means uh, in the community uh, and we're very grateful for that support uh, that we get. But we're also very careful about how we spend uh, the money and we're very pleased again to be able to report this year like previous years, that we spend 90p in the pound on providing the care that we need to. 2014-15 was a great year for retail. We raised £825,000 net profit from the shops for the hospice. We also raised an extra £133,000 in gift aid um, and that total amount there is more than we receive from the NHS every year. We started running two pound outlet and warehouse sales for the first time ever, which saw us take stock out of shops that we hadn't been able to sell and give it a second chance at a two pound warehouse sale. Um, and they raised an additional 20,000 pounds for us through the year. So at Hospice in the World, we're incredibly fortunate to receive a vast quantity of great value donations. We strive to ensure we make the most of every donation whilst offering great value bargains and treasures to our customers. And we've got a really talented team of shop managers. We wanted to invest in our staff, so last year we offered our shop managers the opportunity to participate in a Level 3 MVQ in retail management. So during 2014-15 we opened two new shops uh, in Oxford and Tenterden. We raised an extra £135,000 in sales from those new shops. Like other areas of the organisation we rely heavily on our volunteers and we recruited 200 new volunteers last year. Uh, and we have a 650 strong volunteer workforce um, who run our shops every single day. We couldn't do what we do in our shops without those people. My name is Kate Walker and I'm the personnel director here at Hospice in the Weald. I've been here really just over a year now, joining in May of last year. When I started here in, in May last year, um, I was very clear that we needed to get a, a much more of a structured approach to the role of personnel and, and how we can really help the hospice develop in its business objectives. So one of the first things we worked on as, as a team together was the, the people plan. And, and what we really realised is that there is no one element of dealing with people that's more important than the other. There's a whole string of things. So we tried to capture all of those different things in, in one place. And then we ended up with a structured people plan, which has got five separate strands. One of them, for example, is valuing our people. Um, another one is recruiting our people. Um, and another one is developing our people. So for each one of those strands then, we have a, a series of different projects which help us achieve what we need to do. Well, within the business plan, we are very clear that one of our objectives is to help us all develop towards a coaching culture. Now, you might think that's quite easy and you, you run a coaching workshop for people and that explains what coaching is. But actually, for us, it's, it's much more detailed than that. It's, it's really looking at all of the behaviours that we have towards each other and how we can all work to a culture which really just helps us support each other and helps people to get the best from each other. Following on from that, then, we've, we've run lots of different workshops because, as I said, it's not just about a coaching skills workshop. It's about teamwork, leadership, developing people, supporting each other on, on dignity and respect, all of those things. Um, 
managing difficult performance, so we, your feedback skills, all of these things are important for us in developing a coaching culture and we're working very hard with our group of managers to, to help them understand that and develop those skills. When I'm speaking about the personnel department, I always have to be very sure that we don't forget a really important part of that department is our support services. And that's our housekeeping team and our catering team. Um, they do a fantastic, we couldn't operate without them either, and, and they do a fantastic job. In-house catering produces over 24,000 fresh meals a year and 10,000 fresh sandwiches for patients, staff and visitors. The in-house laundry service processes 120,000 items a year and both departments have risen to the challenge of increased referrals and visitor numbers. Well during the year 2014-15 uh, we reached a really important landmark um, in that we recruited our 1,000th volunteer. Um, now that was a great success and, and we've been working hard to recruit more volunteers. The only thing is we feel now we, we cannot be complacent about that because we're always looking for more volunteers. I came to run the project meeting more unmet need. So making sure that patients got the care that they needed, when they need it and how they need it. Most importantly, dying where they want to die and not where we prescribe they should die. Well, one thing was clear to me was that we couldn't carry on doing the same old, same old. We had to change the way we worked. We had to change the way people were being referred in. We had to look at what was local to us. We needed to change our relationship with the care homes and residential homes. And we needed to change our relationship with the hospital as well. Well, what I was told to achieve was 15% more activity year on year, but it really needed to be kick-started. The intention was to see by 2017 45% more patients than what the hospital is currently seeing. I think that um, we were not addressing the needs of the community. About 3,000 patients or people die in our community every year and yet we were seeing only a tiny proportion of those patients. Um, and we needed to get in there, get amongst the community and make sure they knew what we were, what, was, what we stood for. So once the momentum had started, we, wrote, we had a project group, we talked about it, we talked about all the side issues as well. Uh, we started to talk about how we could improve things and it wasn't just about me. Others came to me and they said, look, Joe, I've thought about this. Why don't we do the rotor this way? Why don't we improve our IT system and our communication with each other. A whole range of things was going on. We started to count the numbers of people that were being uh, referred, how they were referred, when they were referred, just looking at it from all sorts of angles. Counting uh, in the hospice world is not necessarily the sorts of things they want to do. That's what businesses do, that's what uh, the NHS Trust now do. We do caring in hospices, surely, but you can do both. So knowing that it was 15% that we needed to increase by, I said, look, every month I want to see that how far away from this new referral target of 88 are we? And as it happened, everybody became familiar with that. In actual fact, we have seen in the hospice at large 28% more patients uh, than we were in 2013-14. What that means in reality is that we're currently looking after 700 patients, which is about the size of a hospital uh, in the community that we serve today. My name's Bess Warbrick and I'm the fundraising director at Hospice in the Wheels. 2014-2015 was a it was a difficult year at Hospice in the Wheels, particularly for, especially for fundraising. Um, at the end of the year we always like to be able to say that We've smashed our targets and that we've raised even more for patient families and carers. Um, but sadly that wasn't the case in, in, in the past year. Um, as I say, it was difficult for us and we didn't quite hit our targets, um, which is, which is a, always a challenge. But um, because of the support that we've always had from the community, it hasn't meant that there's, there's any risk to our services for patients, families or carers. I continue to be absolutely amazed by how well Hospice in the Wheel is supported by our local community. We cover such an immense area, so communities all across West Kent and East Sussex, up north of Seven Oaks, down through Cranbrook, um, Tenterton, out into Crowborough and Heathfield, and individually all of those places continue to, to just fund us in, in unbelievable ways. 
Collectively, over the year, we've raised half a million pounds from community fundraising. So that's individuals who, who may have at one point been touched by hospice services or, or know someone who has, and they go out and they host pub quizzes, um, they're shaving their heads for us, that, you know, thinking of a million creative ways to raise a little bit of money and every single penny that they raise makes a difference. We've got our, our kind of regular events in the events calendar, so our sponsored cycle, Wheels Around the Wheels, which happens early on in the year, um, our annual Moonlight Walk, um, where so many people choose to walk in memory of a loved one, um, which we continue to have, you know, six, seven hundred people take part in, um, and our annual 10k event in the, in the heart of Tunbridge Wells. Again, six, seven hundred runners coming out, running a whole 10k, which I just think is unbelievable, a huge commitment to us, and all of them raising sponsorship. Of the £7 million that Hospice in the Wheel needs to raise each and every year to keep our services going, um, the, there's one way that we fundraise money that, that brings in more than anything else, and that's when people choose to leave us a gift in their will. So effectively, one in five of our patients is cared for because someone is, has chosen to leave us a gift in that way. So that might be that they choose to leave a one-off gift in their will, um, or perhaps a, a percentage of their estate once, once, they've, um, once they've died themselves. And it, it, it's, a, it's an amazing source of income that someone would think to, to leave us that money, which will then perpetuate the care that other people will be able to get in years to come. It really means that our services for patients, families and carers will continue to be incredibly sustainable because so many people are choosing to think ahead and to give us money in that way. So in the last year we've raised well over £1 million just from people who chose to leave us a gift in their will. As you can see, we were really fortunate to have the labyrinth built in the last financial year, uh, thanks to one of our very generous uh, donors. And it's become a very, very welcome uh, addition to our holistic philosophy of care here at the Hospice in the Weald. As you can see, it's in the most beautiful setting, nestled in our lovely gardens, overlooking the orchards. And everybody who comes down here uh, talks about what a lovely and peaceful setting it is. It's a classical seven circuit design with its path going in, leading all the way in and round into the centre and then back and of course it's wheelchair accessible. And there are lots of different ways of walking the labyrinth. You can think of it as a metaphor of life, the beginning, the middle and the end as you walk into the middle and out. Or as in our leaflet here we suggest um, ways of perhaps offering something as you walk in and releasing maybe a question or an anxiety, um, a concern, and maybe laying that down or offering that up, whichever, you, whichever is more meaningful, as you're in the centre and then coming back out, back into your life again. And often people have felt surprisingly moved or they felt surprisingly released of, of that anxiety and much lighter as a result. Everyone has been uh, very happy with the labyrinth and including staff. It's sometimes been a lovely way for staff to also be able to uh, release worries or concerns that they've had. And many have uh, commented, if I quote from our leaflet, it has helped me find perspective on my life and all that's happening for me at the moment. Or I started off very uptight and anxious. Walking slowly helped me find calm and balance. The labyrinth has helped them find peace or calm, inner strength, clarity, spiritual inspiration. With the Creative Arts Service, we aim to help patients either express themselves using artwork, um, whether that's a piece of artwork, it could be um, a whole series of artwork. Sometimes people have created artwork before and aren't necessarily able to now. For example, we work with a lot of patients who aren't able to use their hands necessarily anymore due to the progression of their disease and we assist them with making artwork so it's their work, we're essentially their hands. Um, the other side of that is producing work that is a legacy to leave the loved ones, um, friends, families, etc. Um, using memory projects of all kinds, whether that's in the format of a book, of a life story, whether it's hopes for their loved one's future, um, whether it's leaving behind certain items that wouldn't necessarily be big enough to go in a traditional will. 
Whilst producing some memory project work with a few patients here in the hospice day service, they wanted to work with their family members, in particular their children. There was a tendency from the spouses sometimes to say, you're ill, you look after yourself, I'll look after the children. Those particular patients felt that there was a little bit of a gap between them and their children now. They couldn't necessarily communicate or do things with them that they used to be able to do. They obviously didn't want to disrupt those children's normal lives and didn't want to take them out of school. Um, so it had to be out of hours. Um, out of that came the Creative Family Saturdays, um, which were for patients to work together so they would get the peer support from each other and actually so would the family members and the children. They're on a Saturday morning between half ten and half twelve. So two whole hours, we generally make a mess, which we're great at doing. A lot of patients use it to bring in their family members that are otherwise fearful, I suppose, of the hospice, whether that's kind of an idea of the hospice or the term hospice. Um, it has been used as a bridge to bring those family members in, particularly for patients who have wanted to end their days on our inpatient unit. They don't want it to always necessarily be that memory and the creative arts can offer a non-threatening way of doing that. We've had so many quotes and positive comments and feedback from patients and their families and their carers about Creative Family Saturdays that I know that they're making a difference. Um, we've had patients who have been so reluctant to bring their family members in and having that non-threatening part of Creative Arts that can bring their family members in has worked so well and they've been so grateful for that opportunity. And as in every year at Hospice in the Weald, our hospice care is of the very highest quality, something that wouldn't be possible without the dedicated workforce, both staff and volunteers, that I am fortunate enough to work alongside.